All right, let's get started. So my name is Logan, and this is Pradyush, and today we're going to be talking about micro TDM. This project aims to bring uh, deep learning to bare metal devices. But first, what do we mean by bare metal? So a bare metal device is just a device that does not feature an operating system stack. So a few examples of these devices might be an FPGA board that's running RISC-V, or maybe an Arduino, just to give you an idea. In this session, we want to start by giving you a high-level overview of what MicroTDM is all about. And in doing so, we want to answer three questions. First, why should you care about MicroTDM? How is it actually used? Then how is it implemented? Then we'll do a demo on RISC-V, and then we'll switch over to Colab. <laughs> so first, why is it important? Programming bare, bare metal devices is very difficult. First off, they're subject to a number of resource constraints. They're usually small, so they don't have access to a lot of memory or processing power. So you need to reckon with that fact. Then also, they don't usually have access to common memory management facilities like malloc, because this is usually provided by the operating system. And then also, in terms of languages, all you really have access to is C usually. That's the most common language. And then, as anybody who's ever used these devices knows, they are painful to debug. But on the other hand, targeting these devices comes with significant benefits. And there are two applications in particular that excite us. The first is integrating machine learning into Internet of Things applications. And the second is speeding up hardware prototyping for machine learning. And today we're going to focus on the second application. So given that most of you are architects, you're probably interested in building your own hardware, right? So suppose, you, suppose you've designed a new chip, and now you want to try uh, running your design against actual machine learning workloads. What are the requirements to do so? Maybe you started by programming directly in your device's ISA, but this is tedious, right? So maybe we should port GCC to target our ISA. Now at least we can use C to program these. But that's also tedious too, right? We have access to all of these machine learning models in, in common frameworks, so maybe we should port machine learning frameworks to, to target C. Then we could compile uh, models to our device. But there's a problem. Most machine learning frameworks don't help you beyond this step. If your, if your machine learning models aren't running very fast, it's probably because these kernels aren't optimized for your particular architecture, because how could they be? You've just designed it. It's very new. But also, because you're writing these kernels in, in raw C or in your device's ISA, now you need to, to debug them too. And machine learning frameworks also don't help you here. And suppose that you've been iterating on designing these kernels, and it's still not giving you the performance that you want. So now maybe it was actually a problem with your architecture. So you want to go back and redesign your, your, your hardware design. Now you need to re-optimize all of your kernels. This is not a good loop. So MicroTVM aims to simplify hardware development. And we do this by replacing hand-optimized kernels with automatically optimized kernels. So now you don't need to debug kernels, and you don't need to inject any human heuristics into the kernels that you write. You can let machine learning do it for you. So this brings us to our goal, which is to minimize the requirements to run and optimize machine learning models on bare metal devices. Doing so would both speed up Internet of Things prototyping and it would tighten the loop for designing machine learning hardware. So that's the why of MicroTDM, and perhaps you're just going to give you the, the how. Um, I'm going to convince you that using MicroTVM is really, really simple. Um, all you need to do in order to use MicroTVM is three simple steps. The first is implement some sort of a low-level device interface to communicate with your bare metal device. This includes two steps. The first is the ability to read and write into device memory. And the second is to be able to start some sort of code execution on that device. And this is really minimal. Next, you would want to uh, get code running on your device. So you need to provide some sort of a cross compiler for your device. And we can support both GCC and LLVM. 
finally, once you have these interfaces set up and the cross compiler ready, you just write TVM models as you usually did with certain modifications. And I'll go over the modifications in the subsequent slides. So let me start by giving an example of how you'd write a simple image classification model in TVM and then show you how you do it in micro TVM. Um, here we have the example of FreshNet where you want to classify the image of a cat. So the way you'd go about doing it is maybe by pulling the ResNet model from a gluon zoo and you build the computational graph that's corresponding to the model. Once you have this computational graph, you can simply execute your model with TVM and you'd get your prediction there that, okay, this is a cat. Now, if you want to do the same thing with micro TVM, the number of modifications you do at a programming level are really tiny. There's just two modifications, in fact. The first is that you wrap the code that you would usually write in a session. This session establishes the communication interface with your bare metal device so that you don't have to dig into the low level details of how data transfer is done between the host and the device. The next is the ability for micro TVM to use the cross compiler. So for that, you specify a custom build function that calls into the cross compiler of your target device. Now that you've seen how you can use micro TVM, uh, let me talk a bit about how micro TVM actually works. The key insight that we try to adhere to while building micro TVM is to reuse most of the components from the TVM stack. And this really gives us a lot of benefits because now you can reuse the high level differentiable IR for micro TVM, which lets you write models in Python, which is really much more simple than writing models in C. Uh, it also lets you reuse auto TVM, which can optimize models on your bare metal device without you having to develop a new framework for it like TensorFlow Lite did. Um, but as we were trying to use TVM for micro TVM, we realized that most bare metal devices do not support LLVM, which was the default code generation backend for TVM. But most bare metal devices do support C, so we extended the TVM code generation to uh, have C code generation support. Now let's take a closer look at how micro TVM functions. So here I have the micro TVM runtime running on the host, and there's a device which could be something like a RISC-V device that you'd want to run machine learning models on. The first thing that micro TVM does is set up a communication interface with this port, which was the low-level device interface that lets you read and write into memory and execute stuff on this port. Um, this could be over a JTAG connection or it could be over a network connection it's totally up to you as to how you want to implement this communication interface. Once you have this set up, um, the, the model that you write is lowered by the micro TVM code generator to a C file. And this C file is cross compiled for the target device using a device specific GCC. Um, this gives you one library and some set of functions that you can load on the board. But in reality, you might want to load multiple libraries and several sorts of functions on the board. So micro TVM remaps these, the, the compiled binary so that you don't have memory or address space conflicts. And this remap binary is loaded onto the device so that you now have code sitting on your device ready to do inference. Um, and when you do want to call a function, you simply send over the parameters to the board and um, the board will execute it and give you the output. So up to this point, what we can see is micro TV, you can call single functions on micro TVM, but models are typically composed of several, several functions. And Logan will tell you a bit more about how we support entire pi application pipelines on, with micro TVM. Yeah, so that brings us to the primary execution strategy for micro TVM, which is the graph runtime. This is a popular execution strategy in mainline TVM, and what it means in micro TVM is that the host drives the overarching control flow of your model, whereas the actual computation 
is done on the device for each of your operators. So let's look at a quick example of this slice of a computation graph. So suppose you have some input flowing into your convolution node. Now what happens is the convolution actually executes on the device, and then the result of the, of the execution is sent back to the host. Now the, the node has been calculated, and you can use it as input for the batch norm later down. So now batch norm executes on the device, and then returns the results, and your model execution continues as normal. So the graph runtime gives us good integration into TVM, and it gives us access to auto TVM, which we have yet to evaluate. So this brings us to the, the next steps of, of micro TVM, which is to actually run and evaluate the auto TVM-based optimization and see what kind of kernels we generate for bare metal devices. And then once we get a library of, of optimized kernels, we can compile all of them and put them all on a single device and then run fully self-hosted models on the device. And then a parallel thread of research would be to integrate custom numeric data types into micro TVM, such as fixed point and other ultra low precision formats. So now we're gonna get to the demo, and after that we'll go to CoLab. So for this demo, we're gonna be using the Oh, oh, I see. It's still on my screen. Oh, yeah, now you can do that. Okay. I still use my option. Well, now it's gone. Where did it go? Uh, hold on. Okay, um, let's make that a little larger. So for this demo, we're gonna be using the Spike simulator, which is a RISC-V functional ISA simulator. Um, so we're gonna start by, by loading that. And then to actually communicate with Spike, we're gonna be using OpenOCD. So most bare metal devices expose a uh, JTAG interface, which JTAG is a low-level debugging protocol. And so we can use OpenOCD open to wrap this interface and give us a higher level interface to, to communicate with the device. So we start that, and that connects with Spike. Now we can start the demo. So for this demo, we're gonna be classifying digits in the MNEST data set on, on RISC-V, and we're gonna be using a, a shrunken down version of, uh, of a LayNet architecture. So maybe the accuracy will be good enough. Um, it, Hopefully it'll be, I think it's above like 80%. <laughs> so hopefully we get, we get a correct prediction. So this is what the actual model looks like in, in Relay, if you actually want to look at the hyperparameters. Um, but I think we'll just move along. So let's take a look at the actual input we're going to be classifying. We need to transfer it over from a server. And so it's a, it looks like a one. So now we've initialized the, uh, the micro TVM session, and you can see that we've loaded the micro TVM runtime. We can see all the sizes. We can see where the, where the text is. <laughs> we can see where all of the sections are being mapped at. Um, we can see that it took about 0.24 seconds to do so. Um, then we have some stuff about auto TVM and um, some other warnings. <laughs> Um, and now we've actually loaded the, the model onto the device, and we can see that it's much larger than the runtime, and this, so it took about like 2.9 seconds. So if we actually execute it, it takes about 0.64 seconds, and the expected label is one, and we actually got one. So one thing you can note is that it's not super fast right now. Um, this is likely due to spike, actually. Um, we have yet to test it on a real board, so it could be the case that we don't actually need to do anything. In any case, we're gonna be looking into making the communication protocol faster on Spike, uh, just because it might be more helpful to developers to be able to use Spike rather than a real board. Um, so that, that's it for the demo. Let's switch over to CoLab now. Oh, 
Um, so whatever can be whatever can be lowered into TVM's low level IR uh, can be uh, we can use the C code gen on that the lower level IR. But I don't we don't fully support um, like all of Relay. There is an, an experimental ahead of time compiler for Relay, and so we want to maybe wait for that to be less experimental before we try using that. But currently, only a subset re of Relay is supported, as far as I understand. No, we're we're uh, I I believe we're just we're just using uh, like default spike. I think with uh, did you have anything? Oh, so uh, we w we could use it if like the GCC compiler compiles down to those instructions. We have not explicitly enabled any tensor instructions for us by. If I understand the question, it's like when do we use C versus Vita, or uh, like the Vita microcode that we generate? I see. So it it depends on what your target device is. If your target device supports GCC, then you'd go down the C path. But like Vita is uh, written for FPGA and it has its own custom microcode. So only if you want to target that specific microcode would you go down that path. Um, currently, we do not. Uh, vectorized instructions are something that we still have to add support for. Um, we don't think it'll be rather complex, but it still needs to happen. Yeah, so we, we only very recently actually got full RISC-V support. So um, this is mainly why we haven't looked into any of these yet, and we'll probably look into all of these, actually. Any other questions? All right, cool. All right. Uh, so just like the previous uh, Colab notebooks, I'll just run this top block of code so that we have everything set up. But while it is setting up, um, I'll go over what we are going to cover in the Colab tutorial. So in the talk, you mostly looked at what micro TVM is, how it works, and what it can do. In this part of the session, we want to focus on how you, as a micro TVM user, could adopt micro TVM for your bare metal device. And for that, we are going to cover um, a few things. The first is the C code generation backend and how to use it. The second is the cross-compiler interface that MicroTVM exposes so that you can compile code for your device. Uh, the third is the low-level device interface that you have to implement in order to actually communicate with the board. And towards the end of the session, Logan will cover the graph runtime and uh, the demo code of a ResNet 18 model on MicroTVM. Uh, so let's go to the C code generator. Um, using the C code, code generator is really very simple. It's the same as using any other code generation backend in TBM. The way you use it is you write a Python code uh, just like you do for, uh, uh, you, you write Python code in Relay. And here we have an example of adding two vectors, X and Y. Both of these are 1,024 entry vectors and all we do is add them together. Um, you can see the output of this function, which, oh, oops, the, the, the build is still going on. Yeah, for the, the oh, yeah. Okay, so here you see the output from Relay, which just simply shows that it's an addition function as I described, and now we can take a look at the C code generated, C code generated corresponding to this function. 
the way this is happening internally is that we are passing the relay function to uh, uh, a function that can build the code into a C source module, and we are just printing out the source code rather than like compiling it right away. Um, this is the generated source code, and if you take a quick look, you can see that we are generating this fused add function, which is doing the addition of both the vectors. It takes in three arguments that are standardized by the TVM pack function interface, which uh, does not vary across the functions generated. But you might notice here that we are actually passing in three arguments into this function. Uh, the first two arguments are the input arrays, and the last is the output array, because we have to specify the memory locations in which we are going to compute and store the output. Um, we are not supporting direct return from the micro microcontrollers that you work with. Uh, you rather store them in memory and then later read them back to your host. Um, the code that follows, this is mostly a bunch of error checking code just to make sure that all of the inputs that you pass into the function are sane and correct so that you don't run into runtime issues. Um, but towards the end of the generated code um, right over here, you can see that this is the C code that's simply adding to vectors. While this is a simple example, we have reused the same code generation backend for also running ResNet. So it, it just goes to show that this is how it works, and you should be able to use it for simple models. Um, now that we have the ability to generate C code, um, we want a way to compile this code to your target bare metal device. And to do so, we have this cross-compiler interface. Earlier, we talked about how you could wrap the code of microTVM in a session. Um, in a session, and here we pass in two parameters. The first is the type of device that you want to compile your code down to. It could be the host if you are emulating a device on the host itself, or it could be a RISC-V device or an Arduino board or anything that you want. Um, the second parameter here is the toolchain prefix. Um, this simply is for microTVM to understand that this is the kind of uh, binary that needs to be used for cross-compilation. So for instance, if you're compiling for the host, this prefix would be null, and microTVM would default to the normal GCC on your device, or on your host. But instead, if this were like RISC-V, it would then use the RISC-V GCC for its cross-compilation. Um, finally, uh, let me talk about the low-level device interface, which lets you read and write to device memory and start function execution. Um, these, these, this interface is defined in C++ as follows. Uh, there are simple read and write commands, which look like any other read-write commands that you might have used, and the execute command has two uh, parameters, the function offset, which is a pointer to the function that you would like to execute, and a breakpoint, which tells the micro device when it needs to stop execution. Because some devices we have observed do not have any definite endpoint where they stop executing, but you might still be able to set breakpoints in OpenOCT. So we uh, make use of that. Um, as an example implementation of a low-level device, um, we'll briefly cover the host low-level device, which simply emulates a micro device on your own host by allocating a region of memory. Um, in reality, this, this sort of allocation would not be done, and you would instead be working with a remote device that you would want to program. But this just is a simple example to show you how this can be implemented. Um, so in the constructor for this low-level device, we pass in the number of bytes which is the size of the memory region of the bare metal device. And um, once this constructor is invoked, we simply mmap a region of memory that's of the appropriate size. In contrast, if you're working with a bare metal device over, let's say, a network connection, what you do in this constructor is simply open a socket to the board and maybe uh, cl clear out the memory so that it's ready for function execution. Uh, the next is the destructor, which simply clears the memory state of the device. 
In case of the host low-level device, we are simply unmapping the map mmap memory. In case of a actual, um, in, in case of an actual bare metal device that's external to the host, you would clear out the memory so as to prevent any memory leaks. But other than that, um, it's also a straightforward implementation. Next, we look at the read and write um, examples for uh, the, the read and write interface that you would have to establish with the low-level device. In, in the host low-level device, all we are doing is copying memory using memcopy between the host memory region and the device memory region that also resides on the host. Um, in contrast, if you're doing it on an actual device, you'd be transferring this data packets over the network or maybe over a JTAG connection. And finally, uh, in the execute function, in, uh, we simply cast the function pointer into an appropriate um, C function and just invoke it on the host low-level device. Uh, on the board, there are interface, uh, for an actual board, there are interfaces that are exposed by things such as open OCD that you could use to do function invocation. But as I mentioned earlier, you would have to stop the execution at some point using the uh, breakpoint. So at this point, we have all the components that we need in order to execute things using micro TVM, and Logan will tell you how applications can actually be executed. Yeah, so we already talked a little bit in the slides about uh, how the graph runtime works at a high level. So let's see what kind of functions we can actually run on the graph runtime. So let's consider this, this simple relay function. All it does is squares the input and then adds one. And we see here you create a session with the host device, empty toolchain prefix, build it, make a random input, and just run it. Then we can get the result, and then we'll make sure that it, that it aligns with the expected result. And it did. But that's not really an interesting function. So let's try running ResNet 18 on, on the host low-level device. And we're going to, of course, as an example input, we're going to use TabbyCat. So luckily, we can again use the MXNet model zoo to, to get ResNet, a pre-trained ResNet, and we can, uh, then we can build it using these, uh, well, we should probably first inspect. So this does look like a ResNet. We have convolution, we have batch norm, we have ReLU. Looks ResNet-ish. <laughs> so uh, then we also have a list of all the, all the names of the parameters that we're setting. So we can see a lot of them are weights, a lot of them for, are for batch norm. And now we can actually build it and run it and then see what it predicts. So one thing to note is that we were, we were not able to run ResNet on RISC-V, but because this is on the host machine, we don't actually have any communication issues, so we can run full ResNet 18. It's still not incredibly fast. <laughs> and we get Tiger Cat, Egyptian Cat, Tabby as our top three predictions. So that concludes our, our CoLab tutorial. And if you want to find out more about MicroTVM, there are some RFCs down below. Um, and you should keep an eye out for uh, RISC-V PR, which will be coming in a few weeks. Other than that, uh, that concludes our session. Any questions? Hmm? So ResNet 18, we can run it on, I, I mean, so we can run ResNet 18 on RISC-V. It takes over 30 minutes, though, <laughs> with the current communication protocol. It's, um, it's partially run. So we don't have self-hosted models yet. So the, the, because we're using the graph runtime, it's the... Uh, the control flow of the model is, is being directed by the host, but each node in the model is being, uh, you're calling out to the device functions.
It's what? It, um, it's just only the control flow is running on the host. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Yo. Um, yes, um, I mean, that's one option as a backend, but if maybe your device doesn't have, um, doesn't have networking support or, or. Just to make your life easier for the moment, because data transfer at the moment takes so long, so that might be a nice compromise during the battle. That's totally true, and like, it would work for some devices, but like, if we kind of narrow it down to even smaller square metal devices for which even kilobytes are yes, but it really but a risk file is pretty yeah. open in the process of yeah. in the IoT space. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? Oh, oh, are you, so you're saying, um, are you talking about the graph runtime slides or? Okay. In the C output, okay. Oh, 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 I see. Okay. So you're saying using like um, like a assembly registers or like yes. oh um, potentially. So you're saying like you could like inline some some assembly in here using this. Okay. Oh oh oh, because because there is this indirection here. Okay, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, potentially uh, this. We, I mean, we just use this because this is like the this is the uh, like the packed function API for TVM. We could maybe modify it in the future um, to to do to flatten levels of indirection like you're suggesting. Um, we haven't really thought about that. 